Hi everyone, thanks for coming to watch these videos. Here's just a little teaser, this mess of all the stuff that this video is going to get into. This beautiful tanning mess. I just wanted to say, if you've been enjoying these videos, if you're learning from them, please head over to my Patreon page if you want to learn more about how you can become a monthly supporter for a couple bucks a month or join a higher tier and get more videos every month. This is still a pretty experimental thing for me and obviously very low tech here during the quarantine. So um, all the support is greatly appreciated and will help me grow this online experience. I uh, hope you enjoy the video. Bye-bye. Hello everyone! It is tanning classroom time. Time to learn about tanning in the classroom. So, today's going to be some indoor, on this rainy day, indoor classroom time about um, the different styles of tanning, some vocabulary, what their names are, why they're called that, and the different layers of skin and how an understanding of those layers of the skin affects and revolutionizes your understanding of tanning okay, and your tanning practice. So I'm going to start off saying that tanning, the word tanning, okay, so as most of you know, this word etymologically refers to tannins, plant tannins, the chemical inside plants that you can use to tan skins. Okay, two very close words, tannin and tanning. So etymologically, tanning refers to just the transformation of skins using tannins, okay? Clearly, that's not how we use the word nowadays. Uh, so, because tanning could be all different types of tanning. So, actually, the word tanning is slang. We use it as slang. Um, and it is slang for, I would tell you, that it is slang for any of a myriad of methods to transform skin, raw skin, and dried raw hide into something more garment-like and more well-preserved. Okay, so tanning is really a slang catch-all word for any of the many, many processes and methods you could use to do that, okay? So why tan skins in the first place? Why, why did humans come up with tanning? Um, uh, it's tricky, I gotta squat. Okay, um, so for one, you know, why not just keep skins raw, right? So there's really I know this is simple and it's, it, it seems obvious, but it's important to break this down. Is that I would say there's really just two main reasons to manipulate raw skin in the first place. Okay? So one of those reasons, the most important reason, is simply to make that skin more preserved, more shelf stable. Okay, because a raw, wet, floppy skin, it doesn't have a lot of shelf life. It's going to rot very, very quickly, right? So all the bacterial activity and enzymatic activity in that skin is going to start to break it down quickly. All kinds of insects and flies are very attracted to it. They will eat it, digest it, lay their eggs on it. Um, that skin is not going to be around very long, okay? Um, yes, if you dry that skin, you know, it will be around much longer. You, ex you extend its shelf life, okay? Um, but for example, here in like the most of the Southeast uh, where I'm tanning, even a fur hide 
if it's well scraped so it doesn't have any flesh left on it, and then dried, whether it's salted or not, um, that whole hide could disintegrate within three months from bugs. It's like a little, I call it hide moths. Um, you see little teeny tiny cocoons in the fur and gradually little holes in the hide and that I've seen, I've seen a stack of salted dried rabbit skins, like 30 rabbit skins, rendered pretty much into dust within three months before, just sitting in a cardboard box in a basement here in the mid-Atlantic. And I've seen fur hides that have been dried and that have lasted for years and bugs haven't gotten to it. So it's a gamble, it's a gamble, okay? But if you dry the skin, you do extend its shelf life beyond wet, sloppy, raw, green skin. That's what we call it. When the skin is completely raw, we call it green. However, when you do any number of tanning processes to that skin, you increase, uh, you preserve it even more, you increase its shelf life even more so that that hide could last 10 years or a lifetime or maybe even multiple lifetimes. Um, not likely, but with natural tanning. So the one most important reason humans have manipulated skins over the, over the planet, over the history of the human story on Earth is one, to preserve the skins longer, okay? Um, and two, two, number two, one, two, is to is flexibility right is to make that skin in any number of degrees more flexible therefore more useful for whatever function you're going for whether it's a bag or a boat or a garment or you know any number of things so typically when we say tanning though most often we mean making the hide flexible enough to become a garment, something you could wear, okay, right? So to go from rawhide, which is very hard, it would be very difficult to wear, right, to something floppy and fluffy that, you know, that you can wear, that just wraps around you, that's um, a garment, okay? So those are the two main reasons that humans tan skins, and therefore they're kind of part of the definition of the slang term tanning, right? Which I'm calling any number of ways to manipulate skin to one, increase its shelf life to preserve it, and two, make it more flexible, most often garment quality flexible, okay, for clothing. So, like I said, like I've alluded to in past videos, I truly believe that there are probably, that the number of ways and methods and nuanced ways that humans on Earth have treated animal skins numbers the stars. I am sure it numbers the stars. It is the most diverse craft I've ever encountered and complex, okay? Um, so <laughs> the ways people have done this is, it's you can never fit it all on a chalkboard. That's what I'm gonna say, but Nowadays, like in the culture where I live, in modern, uh, the kind of resurgence of natural ancient tanning practices, um, earth skills, communities, rewilding, craft communities, um, in all of those, nowadays, I would say that there are mainly two different styles, almost schools of tanning that are the most well-known and the most used. And they're the two that I use the most, okay? Do, do, do. So we're gonna call them the first one.
first one we're going to call it brain tanning. Okay, brain tanning. And the second one, I'm going to call it vegetable tanning for just for the sake of this class. Okay, so two main schools here, brain tanning, vegetable tanning. Both of those are just terms, and there's other names for these methods, okay? But basically, they break down as um, a difference in method. That's it. Um, yes, ingredients a little bit, but the ingredients can actually vary so much that I want to focus on the difference in method between the two tanning types, okay? So brain tanning, this is why it's so confusing. People are like, well, brain tanning, you have to use brains, or no, you use eggs, or no, you use this other stuff. The point is, for brain tanning, you're using, one, emulsified fats. That's what you're using, which is fats that are well, I guess it's like homogeneous, homogeneously combined with water. They are suspended in a homogeneous solution of water molecules. Okay? So any fat that is mixed with water in such a way that you can't unmix them. Okay? Imagine a glass of milk. Milk has fats in there. You can't separate out the fats from the water that easily. Okay? Uh, I mean, you make cheese, obviously. But... Um, not in a super easy way. Okay, so brain tanning is using emulsified fats to basically soften a rawhide and make it floppy in garment quality. So it's achieving that one goal of making a rawhide flexible. But the emulsified fats are doing absolutely nothing to help preserve the hide, okay? Once the hide is dried, the emulsified fats, they're doing no magic to just make that hide preserved. Nothing, okay? So, oh, I should have brought one in. Um, I didn't. It's in the other room. So if I have a buckskin, brain tan style buckskin, a deer hide that's tanned with emulsified fats, softened. If I don't smoke it, like in the other room, I have one that's bright white, it has not been smoked yet. It's just as floppy and fluffy and soft, but it's bright white. That hide has not had any preservative action given to it, none. Whereas once the hide is smoked, the smoke is actually the only preservative in this skin, other than lack of water content, lack of moisture. So the smoke is actually the only preservative in the brain tanning method. Therefore, I'm gonna say the brain tanning method uses emulsified fats and smoke to tan a hide. Smoke carbon. Vegetable tanning, on the other hand, uses, we're using something called plant tannins, which is a phytochemical, a chemical that naturally occurs in plant tissue. So we're using tannins are what is essentially serving the role that emulsified fat serve in brain tanning to make the raw hide floppy, basically, to soften the hide. Now, unlike in brain tanning, tannins, they, um, I won't get into that right now, um, they're doing the action of 
spreading the fibers, softening the hide. But unlike emulsified fats, tannins are also a really strong preservative. One of the most excellent preservatives on earth because they, as a medicine, as an herbal medicine, they're very, very antiseptic, broad antiseptics. Okay, so that's why you don't need to smoke a vegetable tanned hide. There's no need for an extra preservative because the tannins are doing both functions at once. The tannins are going to keep the bugs away and are really great at keeping mold and mildew away, stuff like that. However, vegetable tanning needs a second ingredient because tannins are... I'll probably make another video that's just all about tannins. Like, what are tannins? What are they actually doing to skin? It's a little bit beyond this video. But one thing tannins do is they dry out fibers a lot because they draw out mucus. And medicinally on the body, they are drying. It's part of their property as an herbal medicine. So when fibers are so stripped of fats and oils and uh, mucus, they get very dry, they get very brittle and stiff. So actually we need a pure fat to moisturize those fibers, to help to move them apart from one another, and to strengthen them, to, to, to condition them, basically, so they're not brittle. A pure fat is a fat that doesn't mix with water. Okay, imagine you have a glass of water and you pour a little olive oil on the top. The fat and the water, they stay separate, right? They don't want to mix. Okay, so imagine that is a good example of a pure fat versus an emulsified fat, right? Like milk, or like when you put a brain in a blender with water and it looks like a strawberry milkshake at the end or when you mix up egg yolks in water and it just looks like an opaque yellow, like yellow milk, okay? So the difference between an emulsified fat and a pure fat, like olive oil, rendered lards, those are pure fats. Okay, so here I'm saying that brain tanning is a method of tanning that uses emulsified, emulsified fats and smoke to transform a hide. Vegetable tanning is a tanning method that uses plant tannins and a pure fat to transform a hide. And that's the fundamental difference, fundamentally. So as you can see, you know, with brain tanning, emulsified fats, that means you could use brains, you could use egg yolks, you could use soy lecithin, you could use oil, uh, oil, soap, and water mixed together. Just whatever you got to make an emulsified fat solution that's going to work and smoke. The same with vegetable tanning. You know, if you just need tannins, there are a bazillion, bajillion, million different sources of tannins you can use, right? It can be barks, it can be leaves, it can be extracts, it can be acorns, you know, it's just, it's crazy. The, the number of ways you can get tannins, okay? So that's why people might call it bark tanning sometimes, or tannin tanning, or I could call it leaf tanning if I wanted to. It's still the same method, because it's still using tannins and a pure fat. And that pure fat could be something like olive oil or canola oil or grapeseed oil, or it could be rendered bear fat or rendered pig fat or rendered possum fat. It doesn't matter. Okay, this all makes differences and diversity in skins. But fundamentally, we're still using these ingredients for both methods. And that's what makes them distinct. And they make distinct leather because of those distinct methods. So, okay, um, so now we're going to switch to, let's see what time are we at, 20, um, the layers of the skin, skin layers. So this is what I'm often showing in for in-person classes. So here's a drawing I made of, imagine this is just a, a magnified cut of skin. 
Like if you just took the edge of a skin and cut off a piece with your knife and magnified, way magnified, you know, maybe the skin is only this thick, or magnifying it up so you can really peek inside the width of that skin. And skin is made up of many distinct layers. And for a tanner, understanding those distinct layers is really crucial. It's really important. I feel because it's helping it's helping me understand why I'm doing different things to the skin and what my actions are affecting in the skin. Okay? So if you haven't already, if you haven't learned buckskin, so brain the brain tan style on grain off deer skins is what we call buckskin. Um, the book Deer Skins into Buckskins by Matt Richards. This was one of the first resources I started with, learning natural tanning. And just in the process of learning the wet scrape method of brain tanning buckskins, which is what is in this book, you are forced to develop a really <laughs> in-depth understanding of the layers of the skin because you have to in order to tan buckskin like this. And he breaks it down really well. Okay, so I do recommend, you know, flipping through the chapters of this book, getting to know the layers of the skin as much as you can and the ways he lays out for buckskin. It's just good. It's a great primer on skin layers. Um, but that's just for buckskin. So here, um, Maybe I'll just, I'll just tell ya. Dur, dur, dur. Break the suspense. So, regardless of what type of tanning you are doing, even if you're not tanning a hide and you are making raw hide, no matter what you're doing to that skin, if you're processing it, you are always removing this bottom layer of the skin. So this is the side of the skin that's on the outside of the animal where the hair is growing. This is the side of the skin that's underneath the skin, inside the animal, right? In contact with the muscle fibers. So this bottom layer we're calling the flesh. In tanning slang terminology that gets called the flesh layer. And flesh just means anything on that skin that is not skin. Okay, most of the time we mean muscle tissue and fat. But, you know, anything that's on there. Loose teeth that are stuck on there, dirt, whatever. <laughs> Big chunky fat, greasy thin fat, doesn't matter. Anything that's not skin, we're always removing that layer. And that's why we call it fleshing, is the step to remove the flesh, where we're scraping off all the flesh, all that stuff. Okay? So once the flesh is gone, then it gets a little bit more complex. We have all these different layers in here. The layer right underneath the flesh, it's quite a thin layer, but strong. We call the membrane. Then on the top of the skin, right underneath the hair, it's the thinnest layer of the skin. It's almost like tissue paper. Or if you wet tissue paper, how it just falls apart, it's the thinnest layer. It's almost, it's, you can barely see it. You can see it with the naked eye. But it's very difficult to see. The thin, thin layer called the epidermis. That's the first layer right underneath the hairs, okay? Underneath the epidermis, here, we have the grain layer. That's a more well-known layer. That's the layer that is shiny. All right, so on bark tan, deer hides, that's not gonna, that's not gonna work. Come on, light. You can see how it's shiny. It's shiny and slick. 
with some vein-like textures in it. That's green. Different from the membrane side. Okay, so we have the grain layer, which is thin yet quite strong, has that smooth texture and shiny, shiny texture also. Then, you know, in between the grain and the membrane, we have this kind of broad, the broad in the middle fibers, like all this stuff, all this. Um, and I just tend to call all of that the core fibers. Um, I guess within there, there are different distinct layers, but I just don't find the need to break that down. Um, but so here's all the core fibers. And in general, they're kind of chaotically arranged long and short fibers all tangled up together. That's what makes it so strong is their chaotic arrangement. Okay, so the core fibers, it's just everything in between. And as you can see here, hair follicles, like the base of the hair, can actually be resting at different depths. <laughs> um, sometimes it's like right underneath the grain, just barely. Sometimes it's quite a bit deeper. Sometimes it seems like it's halfway through. Sometimes they seem like they're resting, you know, they can almost, you can almost pull them out from the back side here. So they rest at different depths. It's a bit mysterious to me why they do that, but they do. On different animals it's different too. Different times of year. Okay, so... Okay, so, like I said, regardless of what method of tanning you're using, we're always removing the flesh layer and for the most part, we are always wanting to remove the membrane layer, either to completely remove it or to remove as much of, we, as much of it as we can and kind of just break up the remaining little bits. So either it's just really broken and shredded up or it's totally gone or somewhere in between. Okay, so we're going to break it down even further. Okay, so a fur, if we have a skin and we want to keep it a fur, tan it as a fur, meaning with the fur on, we want the hair follicles to stay in there, okay? Then we've got, here's a hide on the, we call this the flesh side or the membrane side. The flesh has been removed most of the membrane has been removed. Any that's left is really broken up. That's what all those little fuzzies are. Okay. And then this was tanned in the brain tan style. This fur over here, same deal. Flesh was taken off. Membrane was removed as much as possible. Little bits that are left are broken up. There's the little fuzzies. And then this hide was tanned in the vegetable tanning style, the plant tanning style, until it is fluffy, floppy. Pretty similar outcome, right? This is a, uh, sorry, this one's the domestic rabbit. Thick gray hair, beautiful. This one's my Mr. Fox that I always have around, okay? So, two different fur hides tanned using different methods, okay? <laughs> I get cross-eyed on the computer. So, brain tan style over here, veg tan style over here. What is the same about them? So they vary in the method. The fox, had a most, the fox had some brains and some eggs in here and some smoke. This rabbit had some, uh, kind of looks like either sumac leaf tannins or oak bark tannins and some rabbit lard in there, okay? What they both share in common Okay. is that on both hides, the flesh layer is gone. It's been removed. 
and the membrane layer is gone. It has been removed. However, we have purposefully left on the epidermis, which is the thin layer under the hair, and the grain. And thus, we have left intact the hair follicles. Okay? So on a furs, a hide you're planning to tan fur on, you're actually leaving a lot of the layers of skin intact. Okay? Because even even if the mem sorry, even if the epidermis starts to peel up, it will often take some of the hairs along with it. Same with the grain. So with furs, you know, hair follicles are very sensitive. They're the most sensitive part of a skin. Okay? When bacterial activity begins in a skin, it begins around the hair follicles for some reason. I don't know why. So it only takes a slight, slight amount of breakdown to begin in that skin for the hair follicles to rot, therefore the hair to shed out, to come out. We call that slipping. When hair falls out, we say it slips, and we never want slipping hair. So we're really keeping a lot of the skin very intact, okay, for furs, regardless of which of the two tanning methods we're using, okay? And all these fibers, whether they're core fibers or grain fibers, have been tanned by either plant tannins, plant tannins and a pure fat, or by emulsified fats and smoke, depending on method. All right, so the next way we might manipulate skin is what's often done in what's called uh, bark tan or, um, let me see, what did I write on here? Uh, yeah. Most commonly, this is just done on hides we call bark tan. Or you could call them veg tan. What that means is I'm just talking about a hide that's tanned with the vegetable tanning method with the hair off. Okay, so that could be a big old deer hide, you know, it could be different colors, but see how they're shiny, they're pretty big and robust. The grain has been left on the outside, leaving it very shiny, smooth. But obviously we took the hair off. And then on the inside, we took off the flesh and pretty much all the membrane. Okay, so this style of, this style of leather whether it's a big deer or whether it's a little animal, doesn't matter. Here's raccoon leather. <laughs> raccoon leather is one of my favorite leathers. Look at this stuff, it's just gorgeous. Ugh, that nice grain noise. It's like a pair of shoes. Beautiful grain, raccoon has beautiful grain. See how shiny it is. Uh, scars are usually in the grain layer, so you'll see scars. Then there's the membrane side. Okay, so see the difference between grain and membrane. And it can even be as little as, you know, a little squirrel, squirrel leather. So there's the grain, there's squirrel grain. So beautiful! One membrane. Nice stuff. Nice stuff. Okay. So whether it's a deer or a little squirrel, this style of leather, which often gets called bark tan as a slang term, it just means a hide that was tanned in the vegetable tanning method, removing, 
removing the epidermis layer up here on top and the hair, the hair itself with the hair follicles. Okay, so um, and, that's, and that can be done in, in different ways. It can be done you doing a step called bucking, which can be done using wood ash, it can be done using hydrated lime, it can be done using store-bought lye, it can be done doing stream rotting a hide, you can you know use different methods to, to get that layer off and to get the hair follicles out. Okay, so with that style of leather, all we're left with are the core fibers and the grain layer. That's all that's left from the original skin. And that has all been tanned with plant tannins and a pure fat. Technically, could you do this brain tan style? Yes, you can. It's just not commonly done, but yes, you could do the same thing where you take off the epidermis, take out the hair and the hair follicles, and then tan this with emulsified fats and smoke. Okay, and then you'll end up with something that's more like buckskin, but with this grain layer on it. Um, it's interesting. It's actually really nice when I've, when I've seen leathers like that. They usually end up as accidents, but they're really, really nice. I don't know why it's not more commonly done. Okay. Then, so you see we're just like removing more and more of the skin. We can go even further, okay, and we can remove the grain layer itself, okay, and scrape that off. Then all that's left is the core fibers. That's it, you know, maybe just the itty bittiest little remnants of membrane left on the bottom. But for all intents and purposes, we are simply left with just the core fiber layer. And that is the case with two natural leathers, buckskin and suede. Okay, so buckskin, which you guys know, it's tan colored because of the smoke very lightweight like this one is more of a robust this was like a big buck and tough and it's more robust and heavy but still ridiculously flexible this is more of a thin-skinned dough which is just like even thinner and butterier but overall on video they look very similar this would be buckskin brain tan buckskin so getting that skin down to just the core fiber layer and then using the brain tan method, okay? Whereas, oh shoot, where did that bag go? This bag, this deer hide bag I keep showing. Okay, same animal, deer, tanned, sorry, manipulated, so that it's just core fibers left, and then tanned with the vegetable tanning method, okay? So then we get a leather that's called suede, okay? Suede is typically what we refer to grain off vegetable tanned leather. So it's similar, you know, it's much less as you can see here, it's much less bulky and thick than even this particular hide. This is a very small, supple, supple deer. Small and thin-skinned. So it really does crumple up quite a lot. But even still, the suede is more crumpleable. It's lighter weight, it's thinner, and it's more supple than the grain on version. So here we got the exact same thing going on. Small white tailed deer, a small white tailed deer, tanned with the exact same method, same ingredients. This one has the grain left on. This one, the grain has been taken off. So we call this bark tan or veg tan. We call this suede. Okay, so as you can see, suede in properties, it's almost in between bark tan and buckskin 
because of all the pure fats that have been added into this, the weight is heavier than buckskin, okay? The tannins and the pure fats actually add to the mass and the weight of the leather to a greater extent than the emulsified fats do to the buckskin style, okay? So there's the difference there. Same kind of hide, tanned, each tanned. Hey, we're even lining up. Brain tan method, veg tan method, okay? If you want to hear me talk about subgrain, which is the beautiful markings on this hide, um, you can check out the video on subgrain and imperfection, and I talk a lot about subgrain. <laughs> Gosh, here's a rat domestic rabbit hair off. Not something I usually do on purpose, only if the hide is in bad shape and shedding. It's not the it's not my favorite leather, but sometimes it's quite nice. It's very thin, very supple. This one's like a pinkish red, pinkish red color. Pretty cool. I don't know if the light's gonna pick this up. Yeah, I think so. Here's a nice scrap of deer leather where there is both green on and green off leather going on. Yeah, so you can see right here, the grain is intact. It's very shiny, darker brown, almost bluish tinge. And over here, the grain has been scraped off. This whole section here, the grain has been scraped off. So this part here is essentially suede. Suede is a little bit stretchier than grain on bark tan because the grain is a tighter layer. It keeps the hide, it keeps the core fibers from stretching out as much and breathing as much. So there's the difference there, the transition between suede and bark tan or grain on veg tan. Popping in a little extra section here. So I forgot to say, I should have said, um, the reason like why a fur, like this little groundhog, this is about stretchiness. This little groundhog tanned with the fur on. The reason why like furs are not really stretchy, like the leather doesn't really stretch. It's supple, but it's not stretchy. And what we call bark tan, grain on vegetable tanned leather. You know, it's a little bit stretchier than a fur because the epidermis has been taken off, the hair follicles have been taking, taken off. It's a, it allows us to stretch it a little bit more. But then, then we have suede is quite a bit stretchier than both. But still, it's stretchier, but still not very stretchy. And then buckskin is the stretchiest of them all. Quite stretchy, look how stretchy that is. Okay, so there's a continuum of stretchiness. The reason for that is simply on a fur, all these layers are left intact. So the epidermis and the grain, especially those two together, they have a tighter fiber structure. They don't really stretch in and of themselves. They just break, <laughs> they just can crack apart. So if those layers are left on the skin, the core fibers stay tight, right? Because these layers on top are kind of holding the skin together. The core fibers underneath or like, we're like, no, we're gonna stay tight just like this, which is the case on furs and on grain on veg tanned leather, right? Once you take off the epidermis, you just have the grain, the leather's a little bit stretchier. The grain will stretch a little bit, just a tiny bit. Once you take off the epidermis and the grain and there's nothing left but core fibers, 
all those core fibers are free. They're free to move. There's no grain on top that's keeping them cinched together. The core fibers can spread out more and breathe and stretch. So thus we get the stretchiest leather, which would be suede and buckskin. On suede, because it's vegetable tan, the tannins are cinching the leather together a little bit more than with the brain tan style. It's just, oh, those fibers are super spread out. So that's where, that's the, all the, the stretchiness difference, the texture difference. Okay, so that's mainly all that I wanted to cover. That's it, okay. So the different layers of the skin, what they mean, and then yeah, and it's just, you know, it's just to show you, I'm just trying to piece apart, like, why there's so many different kinds of leather, and why we have all these different names for them all, and why the names are all interchangeable, okay? So, um, once you combine different ways of manipulating the skin layers with different methods, all of a sudden you're getting all these different kinds of leather. Then add in there all the different kinds of plant tannins you can use, and different kinds of fat, and different species of animals, and pfft, Already we're in the Pandora's box, just with these two methods, okay? Um, so, you know, if we wanted to be technical about all this, then this method over here, if we wanted to be technical, we really should be calling it emulsified fat tanning. It just doesn't, it doesn't run off the lips as easy as brain tan, but emulsified fat tanning, that would be this method, okay? EFT, emulsified fat tan. And this method, you know, it's called vegetable tanning because it means like vegetable based tannins, which means of the vegetable kingdom, the plant kingdom. Clearly, we're not using vegetables, garden vegetables here. Um, so it's a misnomer also. So technically, if we wanted to be technical, we would call this method tannin tanning. Yeah, I guess they're just not as sexy terms. Emulsified fat tan and tan and tan. Um, but to be technical, you know, that's the difference there. So sometimes you hear people throw around the term fat tanning. And you're like, um, which one are you talking about? <laughs> Pure fat tanning or emulsified fat tanning? And um, for many years, I thought that fat tanning referred to, was just another name for vegetable tanning. Um, uh, and then just, just recently, this past year, um, anybody who's on Instagram and follows Feral, Lion, or Joan, uh, confirmed to me that that is indeed a third method, <laughs> just, which is just using pure fat and no tannins. Um, interesting, very interesting method. Um, yeah, I got to hold like a pair of uh, mittens um, like back in 2014 or something. I was at this little Primtech fair or something and this guy had this pair of mittens that he'd brought back from Europe. He'd been like spending this time with these like primitive skills, badass women in like Scandinavia and that was some hides that she had tanned and made mittens out of them. And they were super soft, and the leather was very light colored, and he called it fat tanning. And I was like, what the heck is that? And then later I realized, oh, it's probably just tannin tanning, just with a really light colored tannins. And now that I think back on it, I'm like, oh, maybe it really was that other method where she was just using just, just a pure fat. So I don't know. It was a long time ago. Um, I'm sure you all have questions if you're on my Patreon. Feel free to ask questions about this video in the comments on Patreon. Um, and I will be making another video at some point about tannins. I hope this was helpful. I can show you one more thing.
da, 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 da. There's one. Here's one. Here's its shape. Here's its grain. There's the coloration of this leather. It's so thin. It's like a tissue. Look, I can just crumple up the whole thing. Just like that. Paper thin. Supple. No crunchiness. Here's the grain side. Membrane side. American bullfrogs! You can tend them! Here's another fun one. Here's the shape. Pretty hard to get the camera to pick up on colors today. It's dark colored because of the tannins. Any of you who are tanners, you might be able to pick up on it from the membrane side. It's almost like, almost looks like cross hatching. It's like the lines of the membrane are like cross hatched. It's very unique to fish. So this is a saltwater catfish, the hard headed saltwater catfish skins. They're tough, very hard to get them this supple, but kind of cool, kind of cool. Vegetable tan style. All right, that's all for now. Goodbye. If you liked this video, go over to my Patreon page. You can become a supporter for just a couple dollars a month or join a higher tier and you get more videos every month, more in-depth videos. So check it out. Bye-bye.